Hare Krishna. Welcome everyone to the Srimad Bhagavatam discussion. Hi. So, can you, uh, yeah, can you make this a little bit go on the top direction? Yeah, good. Abhini. Okay. So, um, we will uh, start with the Mangalacharan prayers and then we will get started with the discussion. So, I will share my screen and hopefully this still works. And we will go to the library, Bhagavad Gita introduction. So those, if possible, uh, recite together or, uh, yeah, we will recite these together. Om Adhyana Timirandhasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Sthapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamahyam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yuta Padakamalam Shri Gurun Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunathan Vitam Tam Sajimam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitamscha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishthaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Desha Tarine He Krishna Karuna Sindho Dina Bandho Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrinda Vaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kalpatarubhyascha Kripa Sindhubhya Evacha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shivas Adi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Okay, so now we will recite the invocation verses for the Srimad Bhagavatam. Hare Krishna, please come. Okay, so once again, this slides with Sri Shukadev Goswami and Parikshit Maharaj and Sutta Goswami with the Rishis at the banks of the Ganges at Naimisharanya. Please uh, repeat after me. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. 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 Narayanam Namaskrityam. Naram Chaiva Narotamam. Naram Chaiva Narotamam. Devim Saraswati Vyasam. Tato Jayam Udirayet Nashta Prayeshu Abhadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhaktir Bhavati Naishtiki 
ಕೃಷ್ಣಾಯ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ದೇವಕೀನಂದನಾಯ ನಂದಗೋಪಕುಮಾರ ಗೋವಿಂದ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ಅಡ್ಜಸ್ಟ್ ದ್ರೀನ್ ಹಿಯರ್ ಬಿ ರೈಟ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ okay <clears throat> okay so mm today's topic we are starting a new topic we spent last i think four months talking about the glories of the holy name and um uh, we went fairly into some depth the story of ajamela then the offenses and also the conversation between lord chaitanya and shri haridas thakur so now i thought we'll start a new topic and uh, one of the uh, topics that um inspires me very much is the story of king bharat so uh where he takes three lives as the son of lord rishabhadev maharaj bharat with whom after whom the bharat varsh the name is given and then he gets another life as a deer because he remembers a deer at the time of his death and then finally he becomes a brahmin by the name of jad bharat and um, goes back to the spiritual world but before that there is this uh, so i wanted i will i began reading the fifth canto so this whole story of bharat maharaj is in the fifth canto of shrimad bhagavat fifth canto is generally very famous for the uh, structure of the universe and uh, that is um uh, known as sthanam one of the big topics of the shrimad bhagavatam is sthanam which is the uh, place or the material creation and that is described in the second half of the fifth canto but the first half continues with the topic of visarga uh and the in the beginning of the fifth canto it starts with the um uh, previous dynasty of maharaj bharat how his ancestors who his ancestors were and so on so we will start from there and see how far we get we might go into the story of maharaj bharat or not and depending on we'll see how it goes nothing is uh, sort of cast in stone right now but we'll see so one of the very 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 beautiful topics in the beginning of the fifth canto is Mm, the teachings of maharaj uh, uh of lord rishabhdev to his 100 sons among whom the eldest one is maharaj bharat and uh, they are just absolutely astounding or wonderful teachings and i wanted to go over that uh spend a few weeks going over the teachings of lord rishabhdev okay so um i don't have any slides i i should have made some slides but i will just share the story so i'll pull up the picture am i still sharing no okay let me uh see i will share the so we have our veda base we go to shrimad bhagavatam we go to canto 5 and in 5 
the fifth chapter is what we are going to focus on. Oh, I'm, I should share my screen. Okay, great. So hopefully you can see the screen. Lord Rishabdev's teachings to his sons. So we will go through this. We'll go into the advanced view. Okay, so this is what we will be discussing today. But before we start, so I'll stop the share. I want to give a, oh, what happened? A quick um, overview, very, very quick overview of what has happened in the previous four chapters. We will dive into the fifth chapter, but <coughs> what happened in the first four, first four chapters. So this chapter, um, this Canto 5 starts with uh, the story of Maharaj Priyavrata. Maharaj Priyavrata is the son of Swayambhuva Manu. In this present day of Brahma, so we just, you know, right, how Lord Brahma's life is divided into days and each day a whole new creation starts and each day of Lord Brahma is divided into 14 Manvantaras, which means there are 14 Manus in every day of Brahma. And the first Manu in the present day of Brahma is Swayambhuva Manu. Now in the Srimad Bhagavatam, all the names of the Manus, 14 Manus are given. Right now we are in the seventh Manu, who is Vaivashvata Manu. This has been given in Bhagavad Gita as well in the fourth chapter. So uh, this is a very, very, very ancient story because it is from the first Manu, uh, Swayambhuva Manu. So he had two sons, Uttanapada and Maharaj Priyavrata. And Maharaj Priyavrata, he's not yet a Maharaj, as in a king, but uh, he is very, very devotional. And he's the elder one, but he uh, takes to the, uh, you know, to, to Krishna consciousness or Krishna Bhakti. And pretty much in the middle of the night, he leaves the palace and goes away and takes shelter of a spiritual master and one of the best possible spiritual masters, Narad Muni. So he goes and practices Krishna Bhakti under the guidance of Narad Muni. And Uttanapada becomes the king. Then what happens is that, you know, many, many Uttanapada is gone. He, he passes away. His, uh, after many years, then his son and his sons, his whole lineage is over his whole dynasty is kind of uh, done. And now there is nobody uh, qualified to rule the planet. Now there was only one ruler of the whole planet. So Bharat Varsha is not just limited to the uh, India, so to say modern India, uh, bounded by the Indian Ocean and Himalayas. It is um, the entire planet is known as Bharat Varsha. So anyway, without going into the cosmology of Jambu Dweepa and Bhumandala and all those things, I don't want to get uh, to confuse everyone uh, a lot. And I myself am confused. So, you know, blind leading the blind, so to say. So we don't want to do that. But anyway, the planet was left without a qualified ruler. And Swayambhuva Manu, he is, of course, still living. He is the Manu. So he doesn't die, but Uttanapad, Maharaj Uttanapada passes away. And Maharaj Priyavrata, in the meantime, is practicing Krishna Bhakti under Narad Muni. So uh, Maharaj Priyavrata comes to Narad Muni's place where his son is there, uh, Maharaj Priyavrata. Swayam Bhuva Manu comes there and uh, requests. Uh, Priyavrata to take the charge of the kingdom. And uh, Priyavrata is saying, wait a minute, what? I don't want to take charge of the kingdom. I'm so happy doing my Krishna consciousness. <coughs> Why do you want me to get back into Grihastha life? Because uh, a king is a Grihastha. So all my Krishna consciousness, whatever I have made progress will be destroyed. And I don't want to do that. So there was a big, you know, in the first chapter and in the second chapter somewhere uh, 
there's a long conversation about uh, between Swayambhuva Manu and Priyavrata Maharaj. And even Narad Muni is not able to, you know, he's saying, yes, your father is also correct. Somebody should take charge of the kingdom. And you're also correct that you should not become a Grihastha. And then finally, Lord Brahma himself arrives. So uh, Lord Brahma is the father of the Manus. So, so to say, Priyavata Maharaja's uh, grandfather, Brahmaji, arrives. And then he advises Priyavrata Maharaj to uh, become the king. And he says that, you know, there is no problem. If you, you can perform your devotional service, your bhakti, even as a king, there is no rule that you have to be a ascetic, a, you know, living in the forest or living in a, that kind of situation to be a devotee of Lord Krishna. Is the audio clear on the Zoom? Yes, Prabhu. Yes. yes. Okay, great. Thanks. So like this, uh, Maharaj Priyavrata and Lord Brahma says, he gives a you know, benediction or makes a promise to Maharaj Priyavrata that you are such a nice devotee, you will never become, uh, uh, you will never leave your devotional service and you will never become a materialist in that sense. So Maharaj Priyavrata agrees and then he becomes the king. So um, I don't remember uh, who the name of his wife is. So, you know, as a king, you have to be a grihastha. You have to have a lineage. You need to have children so that they can run the planet afterwards and so on. So he gets married and he has 10 sons. And the eldest son is uh, Agnidra. So all the 10 sons are named after the after Agni or the fire god. So the eldest one is Agnidra. And uh, there are other names also given in the Srimad Bhagavatam. And uh, after ruling for a very, very long time, millions of years or hundreds of millions of years. Now, this is very, very ancient. So they used to have very, very long life at that time. And then after ruling for a very long time, he gives the kingdom to Agnidra and goes back to his Krishna consciousness, to Krishna Bhakti. So that is in very brief, the story of Maharaj Priyavrata. Very quickly, kind of fast forwarding, Agnidra also runs the kingdom nicely. And his son is Maharaj Nabhi. So, and Maharaj Nabhi is also a very good devotee. He performs very nice devotional service. And one time he performed a very big sacrifice, Yajna. And Lord Vishnu, because of his devotional qualities and his devotional service, Lord Vishnu appears to, in that uh, sacrifice, in that Yajna that is being performed by, by whom? Nabhi. Maharaj Nabhi. And then when Lord Vishnu appears, he, whenever the Lord appears, what does he say? Ask for a benediction. So Maharaj Nabhi asks that I want you as my son. He was in the sort of the parental vatsalya mood. He wanted the Lord as a son. He wanted to be the parent of the Lord. So the Lord says, okay, sure. And then Maharaj Nabhi has a son and he names the son as Lord Rishabhadev. So Rishabhadev is born and uh, then he has to run the kingdom as well. So uh, he becomes the king and he marries uh, the wife. His wife's name is Queen Jayanti. And uh, um, they have 100 sons. And the eldest son is Maharaj Bharat. And that is the whole, the later story of Maharaj Bharat continues in the fifth canto. So among the 100 sons, now Rishabhadev uh, is um, a Kshatriya. 
I mean, he's born as a king, so he's in the Kshatriya. But 81 sons become perfectly qualified Brahmins. So one of the things to note here is that the uh, Varna, Kshatriya and Brahmana, these are Varnas, right? Brahmana, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra, as we have discussed in Bhagavad Gita, Guna Karma Vibhagasha. So even though they were born as Kshatriyas, they became perfectly qualified Brahmins because of their Guna and Karma. So we have examples in the Srimad Bhagavatam about the fact that it is not by birth, it is by Guna and Karma. So just one point. So 81 sons became perfect Brahmins. Nine became the Navayogendras. So their story also comes later. And now remaining 10 sons. And they became perfect Kshatriyas. Among them, not among them, even among the all hundred, the eldest is Maharaj Bharat. So um, ultimately, Lord Rishabhadev also renounces the kingdom and gives the reign or the kingdom in the hands of Maharaj Bharat. So that is how, so I've described sort of narrated in very brief the whole story from Swayam Bhuva Manu to who is the son of Swayam Bhuva Manu who gets the kingdom? Yeah. Maharaj Priyavrata, before that Uttanapada. Then from Maharaj Priyavrata to Agnidra to King Nabi. And then Maharaj or Lord Rishabhadev and then Maharaj Bharat. Okay. So now comes the topic of today's discussion, which is Lord Rishabhadev's teachings to his sons. So one time Lord Rishabhadev was touring the planet. The king would go around the planet along with his hundred sons. And he came across a place where there was a big assembly of rishis, sages. So they thought that it would be a nice thing to sit down and listen from the sages. But the sages knew who is Lord Rishabhadev. Who is Lord Rishabhadev? Lord Vishnu. So the sages said, no, no, no. <laughs> How can you listen from us? We want to listen from you. So they put him at the head of the, sort of gave him the Vyasasan or the sort of the chair, the main authority. They put him into the place of authority and they started, they requested, they all requested him to give instructions. Now, Lord Rishabhadev directly did not instruct the sages. He instructed his sons. And by the medium of instructing his sons, he instructed the sages and all of the humanity. So the, again, the idea is that uh, even the Lord, he doesn't directly instruct those who are not having the proper consciousness to receive that understanding. Like he, I mean, even Shukadev Goswami, is an incarnation of the Lord. He also instructed Parikshit Maharaj when he begged and asked. Who else the Lord instructed when somebody begged and asked? Arjuna, very nice. He also, you know, said, you know, I'm completely clueless now. Shishyasteham shadimam prapannam. So I am your disciple now, Shishya. Please instruct me. I'm surrendering to you, prapannam. So then Lord Krishna begins to speak the Bhagavad Gita. Similarly here, he is speaking to his sons. And we will see a very, very important point that what is the duty of a parent? A duty of a parent is to instruct the son or the children, not sons, sons and daughters, in spiritual matters. And very clearly, Lord Rishabhadev will say one should not become or take the position of a leader if you cannot instruct your dependents in the spiritual knowledge. Anything else, if you are doing and missing out on this ingredient, you should give up your position of leadership. One is not fit to be a leader if one cannot lead spiritually. 
very clearly he says that anyway so on the pretext of instructing his sons he instructs all of humanities all of humanity so that is the sort of the little bit history of how the the context background context so uh, this so we will what am i sharing oh this chapter so as you can see uh, this chapter has 35 verses if i am not wrong babu ji we are unable to see your screen you are not able to see the screen yes prabhu ji oh, sorry mm. yeah now we can see it okay great thank you thanks so this chapter has the <coughs> 35 verses and uh the first 27 verses are instructions and then last 9 verses 20 or 8 verses 28 to 35 are how lord rishabhadev demonstrated what he taught just like lord chaitanya mahaprabhu so lord rishabhadev uh became he he also renounced the kingdom and he became a ascetic completely detached and performed devotional service himself so in the first 27 or so verses lord rishabhadev is describing very beautiful very very deep and important instructions and some of these inst- and all of these instructions are obviously 100% aligned with the teachings of bhagavad gita uh but there are some points that come up uh, which at least i found to be very striking and not directly mentioned in bhagavad gita um of course they are mentioned in the purports of shrila prabhupad and we have all heard them many 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 times for example the duty of a leader is to instruct his dependents or the followers now parent is a leader for whom for the children a king is the leader for the subjects a teacher is the leader for his or her students so whoever are the dependents on the leader the primary duty is spiritual instruction that is not clearly like in very clear words said in bhagavad gita anywhere but uh, it is said here so in that sense but of course shila prabhupad in his purports has covered everything but i thought you know it is a very wonderful uh, set of instructions um that that are described here another very beautiful instruction that is uh, coming up in these verses is the position of devotees later on we will see in a few weeks how uh, lord rishabhadev describes the whole hierarchy of the various uh, sort of species all the way from uh, dead matter above that are you know some plants then some animals then humans then the demigods and so on all the way to lord vishnu at the very top but then he says there is somebody else at the top of lord vishnu who is that no the devotees yes vishnu and krishna there is not much distinction in the shrimad bhagavatam so the devotees very clearly he says you know the devotees are above lord vishnu and he gives very wonderful reasons why he says that devotees are above the lord himself so you know one of the reasons is for example the lord has all opulence right the lord is fully opulent and the lord so to say i am paraphrasing uses his opulence right lord krishna is in dwarka for example lord vishnu is in vaikuntha and he's he's you know in the midst of his opulence but the devotees have full access to the lord's opulence whenever they want they can get the lord's opulence but do they take the lord's opulence no they are only interested in serving the lord 
So they become greater. They have access to the whole opulence, but they don't use it. So in that way, and there are other reasons also, very beautiful instructions by Lord Rishabhadev too. So having said that, let us go into the um, verses themselves and see and relish the Srimad Bhagavatam. This is one of the very, very beautiful portions of Srimad Bhagavatam, the teachings of Lord Rishabhadev to uh, his sons. Okay, so first verse. So it is 640. So let us see, we can maybe cover a few verses. So we'll go through mostly all the verses which I have chosen, which are mostly all of them. We might skip some. So the first, <coughs> the first three verses are about the purpose of human life. Now, seems very basic or at least for those who have been attending Bhagavad Gita or listening to Bhagavad Gita or Srimad Bhagavatam, seems like a very basic topic, but we will see some very nice, very nice points, the purpose of human life. So what is the purpose of human life? Anyone on the Zoom or? Self-realization. Self-realization, yes. And what is, what should not be the purpose of human life? Sense enjoyment. Sense enjoyment. Very nice. Exactly. So that is exactly what is said here. What is the purpose of human life and what should not be the purpose of human life? And very uh, sort of striking example is given. Very striking example is given. And Srila Prabhupada gives this example in his first class, so to say, or very basic class, 101. Even if he's talking to completely new people in a pandal program or, you know, where people have come to hear anything like this for the very first time, he would say this. So very basic instructions, but uh, Lord Rishabhadev starts with these instructions as well. Okay. So let us go into that. So uh, we will uh, go through the verse. And as you all know, Hari Parshad Prabhu just visited us. I liked his sort of format, sort of very much going. We used to do kind of like that anyway, go through the verses, but going through line by line, repeating in the group and what he called as Anvaya. So let's try uh, doing that. So uh, we will all recite line by line okay i will recite try to i have done some practice of course i'm by no means anywhere even close to him and his meter and all that is all, my mind is all screwed up but we'll give it a humble attempt okay the more important thing is the attempt uh you know leaving the perfection to krishna and uh, and parampara okay so Rishabha Uvacha. So you can see the screen, right, everybody? Yeah, okay. Nayam deho deha bhajam riloke. Nayam deho deha bhajam riloke. Kashtan kama narhate vid bhujam ye. Kashtan kama narhate vid bhujam ye. Tapo divyam putrakaye na satvam. Tapo divyam putrakaye na satvam. Shuddhet yasmad brahma saukhyam tvanantam. Shuddhet yasmad brahma saukhyam tvanantam. So let us go word by word or the line by line. So Rishabha Uvacha. So Lord Rishabdev starts speaking to the assembly of whose assembly? Who's in the assembly? Sages and his sons. And his sons. Okay, just making sure everybody is following. So Nayam Deho Deha Bhajam Nriloke. So not the human body, Deha. Nayam means not. Not this. So I will 
you can also see here the word by word so i will display this part and the word by word so the devanagari is gone if anybody is interested in devanagari you can look it up on your device so nayam deho deh bhajam nriloke so not this human body in this world of the living entities so deh bhajam means all the living entities who have taken birth but this planet nriloke this planet is called nriloke nri means naraloka the planet of the because the dominant species of this planet is the humans so in one of the translations it is also written as manushya loka the planet the planet of the manushya nriloka and there are so many living entities uh, that are there but especially for the one who has the deha of the nriloka which means a human body so shrila prabhupad and 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 shrila vishwanath chakravarti thakur who are the two primary uh, commentators or the commentaries that at least i use and all the devotees uh, uh, all the followers of shrila prabhupad use say that this verse therefore says that for the human body or for the human life what is the purpose nayam deho deh bhajam nriloke so kashtan kaman arhate vid bhujam ye this is to be used for or the line says is to be used for all the trouble from sense gratification so nayam it is not supposed to be not supposed to be used for kaman arhate for this kama which is very troublesome kashtan kashtan kaman and it is available even to the vid vidbhujam vidbhujam means to a pig a pig also has lot of sense gratification you go and ask a pig how tasty the stool tastes what will he say hmm? very tasty it's one of the most uh, tasty things like for us it is gulab jamun so they also do a lot of sense gratification so what is the point if we are also doing sense gratification okay tapo divyam putraka yena satvam so putraka means my dear sons so he is instructing his sons instead what you should do is tapo divyam by which you become in the mode of goodness satvam or your heart becomes purified so you should do austerities or tapa and tapa on whom tapa on the divyam so it's not just tapa you must not because austerities can be done simply for the sake of doing austerities but here tapo divyam means not just austerities austerities towards the lord by which one becomes purified shuddhye yasmad brahma saukhyam tva anantam and this the heart becomes shuddha and one gains eternal spiritual happiness brahma saukhyam one gains brahma sukha brahma sukha means spiritual happiness and which is anantam there is no end to that happiness so it is spiritual happiness all material happiness as we know is temporary it has a beginning it has a end this happiness that one gets from the tapo divyam is unending and is spiritual so what are the main points of this verse the main points are that what is the purpose of the human body and even pigs get to do sense gratification so we must make use of the human body to do something which other species cannot do like this example i read you know this is iphone right it looks like to a to a stone age person it will look like a you know some kind of a piece of stone so he can use this to break some something so he is illiterate we will call him illiterate yes you can break something else you can break a crack a nut with this thing but is that the purpose of this that is not the purpose of this so we must you can crack a nut with a ordinary piece of stone 
So similarly, even a pig can do sense gratification, immense sense gratification. So we should use the human life for doing something which is only possible in human life. And that is not sense gratification. Because we see that in other species also that is possible. So what is the only thing that, what is the thing that only humans can do? Tapo divyam. To meditate on the Supreme Lord. Cats and dogs possibly cannot meditate on the Supreme Lord. And by, the, by, the, by doing that, the heart and mind becomes purified and one gets <coughs> Ananta Brahma Sukha, unending spiritual happiness. Okay. So we will read the translation. So let us see, we can start from here maybe. Uh, Prabhuji, can you read the translation? Translation. Lord Vishwadeva told his sons, my dear boys, of all the living entities who have accepted material bodies in this world, one who has been awarded this human form should not work hard day and night simply for sense gratification, which is available even for dogs and hogs that eat seed. One should engage in penance and austerity to attain the divine position of devotional service. By such activity, one's heart is purified, and when one, when one attains this position, he attains eternal blissful life, which is transcendental to material happiness and which continues forever. Okay. Clear? Okay. So, next verse, we'll go to the next verse. So, the next verse is again very, very, very important, super important verse. So, the next question and these links from verse to verse to verse are given very nicely in the commentaries by Srila Prabhupada and Sri Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. So, the next verse is okay, how do we perform Tapo Divyam? How should one do this devotional service? What are the key ingredients or what are the important, most important aspects of devotional service by which one's heart becomes purified and one can make spiritual progress and gain spiritual Brahma Sukha, Ananta Brahma Sukha, unending spiritual happiness. So guess what is the answer? What is the foremost spiritual activity? Okay, that is devotional service, but a specific aspect. And if you read the verse there, you will kind of see it, but... Serving the devotees. Yes. Associating and serving the pure devotees. And of course, not serving materialists. Not associating with those who are materialists. So these couple of verses will explain what defines a devotee and what defines a materialist, some of the characteristics. So again, those who have been attending many, many classes and read Srila Prabhupada's books, etc. None of this will be very new or surprising, but still through the verses of Srimad Bhagavatam, it, at least it hits very strongly. This is directly coming from the words of the Srimad Bhagavatam. So we will recite this verse, number two. And the focus is, what are the primary activities that comprise devotional service? And what does not comprise devotional service? What are some of the things that define that this cannot be devotional service and this is devotional service? Okay. So please repeat. Mahat Sevam Dwaram Ahur Vimuktesh. Mahat Sevam Dwaram Ahur Vimuktesh. Samo Dwaram Yoshitam Sanghi Sangam. Samo Dwaram Yoshitam Sanghi Sangam. Mahantaste Sammachitta Prashanta. 
द्वारम विच इज द डोर to ahur vimukti vimukti means to of liberation so service and association association and service of pure devotees is the door to liberation that is the first thing that one must do and in fact shila vishwanath chakravarti thakur says there are nine stages of devotional service who remembers the nine stages not the nine processes but the nine stages what is the first one shraddha then sadhu sanga then bhajan kriya then anarth nivritti nishtha ruchi asakti bhav prem okay so there is sadhu sanga as the second one but he says that that sadhu sanga which comes after shraddha it comes after shraddha correct that means there is first shraddha there is faith and once there is faith with that faith you listen from the sadhus so you in the association of sadhus you listen from the sadhus but the faith has already been established before the faith has been established how did the faith get established what was one of the key ingredients of establishment of the faith that itself is the preliminary association of the sadhus that sadhu sangha which is after the shraddha is a more advanced stage of association where the faith has been established but to establish faith a preliminary level of association is mandatory so the devotional service starts with mahat sevam association and service of the pure devotees okay next line tamo dwaram yoshitam sangi sangam so on the flip side what is the dwar to tamo to ignorance or to hellish conditions yoshitam sangi sangam what is yoshitam mean Hmm? women sangi sangam this is important it is not just association with women that is not mentioned here otherwise okay we should not have all the women that's not the point so it's not about uh, gender discrimination at all we must understand it is yoshitam sangi sangam it is the association of those sangi sangam yoshitam sangi who always are running after the what we call as wine and women to not associate with such people that mentality is that which with we we should not associate it's not the disassociation with females that's it's not a gender discrimination statement at all by any stretch it is the disassociation with those who are uh so materialistically degraded that all they can think of is this aspect of sense enjoyment is that clear sangi sangam yoshitam sangi sangam clear so that is the that is considered to be the highest form of sense uh, uh sense gratification um and, and leads to all kinds of hellish conditions and we will see that very you know this 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 concept is going to be elaborated a little bit in the 
in the next verse as well that okay uh, questions can arise that okay what about householder life one is married you know uh, and marriage happens between man and woman again we are not going to go into the all the lbgt and all that area right now but marriage is between man and woman so you know what is that yoshitam sangi sangam and all that we will discuss what is the that is that will be clarified then next line mahantas te samachitta prashanta so these mahatmas are now the qualities of the mahatma how to find so the first line said mahat sevam you have to do seva and association and seva of mahatmas who are mahatmas how do you find or how do you recognize a mahatma so several qualities are given of a mahatma <coughs> mahantas te samachitta so first thing is they are samachitta samachitta means they see everybody as equal they don't have this conception of i like you i dislike you or you know any of those things i like uh, only indians i don't like uh, americans or i whatever it may be you know bodily likes dislikes samachitta prashanta who are always peaceful gentle friendly okay and then vi manyavah manyavah means no anger which are free of anger vi manyavah so which are who are free of anger suhrida where has this word occurred suhrida suhridam sarvabhutanam lord krishna says i am the friend or well wisher of all the living entities suhridam sarvabhutanam mam jatva mam shantim rachati so these mahatmas are suhrida which means they are the well wishers of all living entities and they are sadhus sadhavo ye so how do we recognize these pure devotees they are samachitta they are prashanta they are vin, vimanyavah they are suhrida and they are sadhus so these are the qualities by which we can recognize these mahatmas and we should do mahat sevam and one of the in in the commentary it is described one of the main characteristics of sadhus is to not find fault with everyone to see the good in everyone and not find fault in everyone so that is one of the very primary characteristics of a sadhu okay so let us read the translation of this one and i want to you know this say something about the translation here so prabhu ji can you read translation som or prabhu ji i i don't know your name asish yeah can you read the translation loudly one can attain the path of liberation from material bondage only by rendering service to highly advanced spiritual personality these personalities are impersonalists and devotees whether one wants to merge into the lord's existence or wants to associate with the personality of god had one should render service to the mahatma for those who are not interested in such activities who associate with people fond of women and sex the path to hell is wide open the mahatmas are equipoised they do not see any difference between one living entity and other they are very peaceful and are fully engaged in devotional services they are devoid of devoid devoid of anger and they work for the benefit of everyone they do not behave in any abominable liberal way such people are known as mahatmas okay 
so how to so what did we learn here how to identify mahatmas and once you have identified a mahatma associate with them and serve them okay now here very interestingly what is shila prabhupad said here these personalities are impersonalists and devotees so this is surprising <laughs> impersonalists and devotees <clears throat> so impersonalists means they are brahmavadis not mayavadis brahmavadis are those if you see all the characteristics that are mentioned here they are also detached from materialistic sense gratification and if we'll go back to the verse they are also samachittah equipoised look at everybody equally prashanta you know peaceful and calm vimanvaha vimanyavaha not angry well wisher and sadhus gentle but they are also at the same time not offenders to the supreme lord now in the next verse so therefore <coughs> both the personalists or the devotees who are in the personalist aspect and impersonalists are uh, referred here and the key word again little bit going into the details here what is in the first line mahat sevam dwaram ahur vimuktesh so vimukta means there are two types of liberation vimukta that's what i understood from reading the commentary refers to two types of liberation personal and impersonal liberation vimukta so because vimukta has been used it means both type of uh, sadhaks personalists and impersonalists are referred in this verse anyway so that is the reason but it is okay to be a impersonalist as long as one is not offending the supreme lord the brahmavadi they want to get brahman realization but at the same time they are aware of the position of lord of the lord that he is spiritual that is the key distinction that the lord is spiritual mayavadis they think that the lord is material so that is the key difference so they consider the lord to be spiritual but they are interested in brahman realization and that is they are sort of the good kind of impersonalists not the bad kind of impersonalists okay so let me see what else to say here yeah now in the next verse it will be described one sec in the next verse it will be described that the devotees there will be a hint to the devotees and it will be described that the devotees don't have to perform or they don't have to give up any householder life they can continue to perform their householder duty so in that sense the third verse is also very important so we'll go to the third verse hmm. okay why is this coming here okay. i need to mute someone okay third verse so in again to emphasize the third verse is describing the qualities of a devotee the second verse was describing the qualities of a spiritualist one who is interested in spiritual progress who is a spiritual person mahatma but the third verse is specifically focusing on the qualities of a devotee the personalist devotee the bhakta so that is why the first line starts with somebody keeps getting unmuted please keep yourself muted 
unless you have a question. So the first line itself is describing that he is a devotee of the Lord. So we will recite the verse. Yeva mayi she krita sauhridartha. Yeva mayi she krita sauhridartha. Janeshu deham bhara vartikeshu. Janeshu deham bhara vartikeshu. Griheshu jaya atmajarati matsu. Griheshu jaya atmajarati matsu. Na priti yukta yavadarthascha loke. So great. So the first line is saying, Ye va mayishe krita sauhridartha. So please understand or, or pay attention here. Ye va, those who are maya mayi ishe. So Lord Rishabhadev is saying this and he is the Supreme Lord, but he is using the word Ishe. So to the Supreme Lord, Mai Ishe, me, who is the Supreme Lord. So he is referring to the Supreme Lord. So this is directly referring to the Lord, Isha. Isha is Lord, Isha Upanishad. We have the Isha Upanishad. It's the Upanishad which describes the characteristics of the Supreme Lord, of Ishwara. So Mai Ishe. Krita Sauhrida Artha. This is described, uh, this word is very important. Krita Sauhrida Artha. So, <clears throat> who want to, uh, or Artha, what is Artha? Meaning. Huh? meaning. No, that, money. or Artha. The, so, money, but you can think of it like a means. Money. It is the means. So who are, that is the, that's the goal. That's something that you want to achieve. So for that, for that achieving Sauhrida, Sauhrida means friendly relationship or a loving relationship with Isha, Krita, who is, Krita means who is doing activities, who is developing. So who is developing loving relationship with Isha. Krita, for the purpose of developing loving relationship, who is doing activities. So you do activities and the purpose, the artha, the goal is to develop loving relationship. With who? With Isha. So one whose activities are geared towards developing a loving relationship with God. Who is that person? A devotee, a personalist devotee. So in the first line, a personalist devotee is being referred. And then he or his qualities are also similar to those who are impersonalists. What is that like that? Janeshu dehambhara vartikeshu. So... And the word na is there in the last word, na. So it's not like this. So which means that this person is not like the materialistic people, the Janeshu, who are Dehambhara Varti Keshu. Varti, Varta. What is Varta? Talking, Varta Lap, you know, just conversation. Who are always talking about Dehambhara. Everything related to the body. You go and talk to anybody, oh, you know, oh, I got a new job, I got this new house, I got, you know, my wife uh, is doing this, here we go on vacation, my son is doing this, my, you know, this. Everything is about what is going on in their material life. That is all the conversation about. So that is Dehambhara Varti Keshu. So these people, who are interested in developing a loving relationship with God, they are not interested in associating with these materialistic people who are always talking about bodily things, who are always interested in bodily matters, right? Such as Griheshu, house, new house, oh, what is the interest rate? Oh, you, you know, 
or this this neighborhood is having good new houses we should move or oh you know i got a raise so i should you know um get a new house and this and that jaya jaya means wife atmaja children rati means wealth and other friends so all these things are part of the deham bhara connected to at a bodily level connected to us my wife my child my home my wealth my property consisting of all these things they are con continuously just keep talking 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 okay <clears throat> and these people who are interested in developing a loving relationship with god they are not interested to these things na preeti yukta hari krishna so they are not interested in all these conversations but who live by yavad arthash chaloke in this material world they are living still but yavad arthash means that they are still performing the duties of a of living in this material world but they are not attached preeti yukta they are not attached to these things so it is the attachment which is missing it's not like they are um, not even present amidst griha jaya atmaja rati it's not like they are not present within these things they are present but they are not attached to them that is the meaning so this is describing a householder so a devotee can very well be a householder as long as he is not attached to all these things this is all that is going on in his mind conversely what is going on in the mind krita sauhridartha to isha how can i develop a better loving relationship with god that is what is occupying their mind okay so let's read the translation so maybe mata ji will have mata ji read one of the mata ji read translation who can megha mata ji those who are interested in regarding krishna consciousness and increasing their love to god head do not like to do anything that is not related to krishna they are not interested in mingling with people who are busy maintaining their body eating sleeping mating and depending they are not attached to their homes although they may be householders nor are they attached to wife children friends or wealth at the same time they are not indifferent to the execution of their duties such people are interested in collecting only enough money to keep the body and soul together thank you thank you so as you can see here this verse is describing devotees and even householders who are devotees <coughs> to be a devotee you do not have to become i mean narad muni is one of the greatest devotees but you do not have to become like narad muni no wife no child no you can become a devotee like maharaj ambarish we when we studied the past time of maharaj ambarish we saw that he performed one year long vrata and did he perform that vrata alone no whom did he perform it with his wife so he and his wife both performed the vrata and he was one of the greatest devotees of the lord the sudarshan chakra was constantly protecting maharaj ambarish durvasa muni unfortunately did not know that and that's why he you know played with fire so to say and got into a lot of trouble so what to speak you know these are that's the power or that's the position of devotees that the lord gives his own personal weapon to protect the devotees and these devotees don't have to be ascetics they can be householders so that is very clearly described in this verse so uh, acharyas have said that what is to be avoided is material consciousness not material things per se the material consciousness has to be 
avoid it. Okay. All right. So now we will go into the fourth verse. So one can ask the question that, okay, um, I should always um, what was said in the previous verse that those who are having this material consciousness they are um, that is tamodvara and the highest material consciousness is what? Thinking about or having lusty thoughts about opposite gender that is the sort of the topmost material consciousness that one can have and then everything else is there below my house my wife my child my property my wealth all those other things follow but one can ask the question that there is also the concept of dharma artha kama isn't it i will perform dharma or dharmic activities the karma kanda basically i will get the benefits of performing dharmic activities and then I will enjoy karma and then I will do dharmic activities again. So why that is not okay? What is the problem in that logic? Why do I have to do devotion? Why do I have to become a Mahatma or associate with Mahatmas? Why cannot I just do dharma, artha, kama and be happy? Okay. Are you following? So that is described in this verse. And the main point of this verse is that the desire for sense gratification leads to, ultimately it leads to sinful activities. That is why the word that is used is tamo dwara. It is the door. It starts somewhere. Once you enter the door, you, it's not just tamo you keep going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper step by step starts with a small step and keeps going further and further and further. So it leads to sinful activities. The Dharma Artha Kama is a perfectly valid aspect or you can, one can live their life by that. But the Dharma part, people forget that Dharma part also has involves a lot of self-control and detachment. You will get the results out of doing your dharma and you need to be satisfied with what you get. Enjoy that and continue to perform dharmic activities. But one doesn't stop there. One begins to desire more than what he deserves through his dharmic activities. And how do you get more than you deserve? What is the only way to get more than you deserve? Sinful activities. Sinful activities, exactly. And there the downfall or the slippery slope begins. So the point that is being made here in this verse is that the desire for sense gratification leads to more sense gratification and more sense gratification and it invariably, undoubtedly leads to sinful actions, which becomes the biggest impediment in spiritual progress. And this is how one becomes entangled in the cycle of birth and death and keeps getting different, different bodies, cat or dog or human or whatever, you know, based on his karma and his uh, karmic baggage and his karmic reactions. Okay. So that is the point that is being brought out in this verse. So let us read this verse. Noonam pramattaha kurute vikarma. 
यद इंद्रिय प्रीतय आप्रुनोति न साधु मन्ये यत आत्मनोयम असन्न अपी क्लेशद आसदे हे देहा हा सो नूनम प्रमत्तह कुरुते विकर्मा सो अ पर्सन हु इज मैड प्रमत्त Pramatta means mad. Pramad. Pramad we know as madness. Pramatta, same root word. So madness <clears throat> after materialism. Okay, so when we, I want materialism. I want materialism. It leads to, it causes one to kurute. Means it causes one to do what? Vikarma. And from Bhagavad Gita, what what we know, vikarma is what? Hmm? forbidden activities or sinful activities what are the three types of karma that are described there karma karma vikarma yeah karma or sa karma we can call it karma or sa karma a karma and vikarma so a karma is action that does not produce any reaction so that is spiritual action or action done with spiritual consciousness either done as yad karoshi yad ashnashi yad juhoshi dadasi yad yad kurushva yad tapasyasi konteya tad kurushva madarpanam so do everything with krishna consciousness that becomes a karma <coughs> otherwise it is in two categories sa karma and vi karma but this excessive desire for sense gratification pramatta Pramatta means this excessive desire, madness, for sense gratification leads to kurute vikarma. First line itself is saying, if you have this excessive desire for sense gratification, you will end up doing sinful activities. No doubt, Bhagavatam is saying that. So don't think that oh, this is all my rightful. You know, I can do it. So. When yad indri indriya pritaya apranoti, when one engages in indri pritaya, indri pritaya means to for the um, benefit of indriyas for senses. When one does actions, when one engages apranoti means act, engaging, engaging in actions for indri pritaya, indriya pritaya for the. happiness of the senses or for the pleasure of the senses for the enjoyment of the senses when does one does that na sadhu manye yat atmanoyam this is not good for the soul atmana the sadhu word means it is not good the the another meaning of sadhu means whether it is beneficial to one so it is na sadhu not beneficial for the soul why it is not beneficial for the soul when one does excessive or desires excessive sense gratification and leads to sinful activities because then what happens he gets trapped in the cycle of birth and death in various various bodies asan api kleshad asadeha that he becomes he gets into klesha into misery and gets into these temporary bodies asan dehaha temporary bodies means one body then another body then another body then another body then another body so one gets into this whole cycle of birth and death so therefore thinking that okay i will not develop spiritual consciousness i will just follow the material formula of dharma artha kama and i can avoid tamo dwara that is not a good answer for that also you need a lot of self control you need a lot of detachment you need all those things the best way is to attach our mind to the lord and that is 
described in Ishe Krita Saharada Artham. Trying to develop or doing activities that lead to developing a loving relationship with Isha, with the Lord. So somebody, maybe one Mataji on Zoom can read the translation this time. Uh, is Which verse is this? Yeah. Could somebody from Zoom read the translation? We've had some devotees on the room read it. So yeah, I can read Prabhuji. Yes, go ahead, Mataji. Kalyani Mataji. Yeah, Hare Krishna. When a person considers sense gratification the aim of life, he certainly becomes mad after materialistic living and engages in all kinds of sinful activity. He does not know that due to his past misdeeds, he has already received a body which, although temporary, is the cause of his misery. Actually, the living entity should not have taken on a material body, but he has been awarded the material body for sense gratification. Therefore, I think it not befitting an intelligent man to involve himself again in the activities of sense gratification by which he perpetually gets material bodies one after another. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mataji. Very nice. So, you can see here how Lord Rishabhadev is instructing that just uh, trying to gain or trying to desire for limited sense gratification is not the answer. It invariably leads to vikarma and traps us deeper and deeper and deeper into lower and lower species, ultimately leading us to the state of tama, which means the state of ignorance and hellish living. So we will, it's already 729. We will stop here. I thought we could do one more verse. So we'll continue with the next verse next time. <clears throat> the next verse also is uh, um, in, 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 this, in this direction itself that um, Yeah, I'm I'm forgetting the key point there, but yeah, it's also in this in the in the similar in the similar aspect that by um, by going in the direction of self sense gratification, one goes into lower and lower uh, consciousness. Okay, so any discussion or any comments or questions? First, we'll take from. Zoom, anyone? Thank you, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Prasad. Ah. I couldn't attend. Um, I was outside doing some. But yeah, I, I wanted to listen at least as much as I could. So sorry, I couldn't pay much attention to. But I just uh, heard about uh, what you mentioned. Um, about householders, Prabhu, and we gave the example of Ambrish Maharaj. But the first thing which I came into my mind. And I, undoubtedly, I think the best would be Bhaktivinoda Thakur, the householder, who did, the, I mean, it was the first one came to my mind uh, about doing the bhajans. Uh, you can be a householder, if you're not attached to his, even had, he had 10 children. <laughs> and um, so, and he did, and we all know his routine, so to say, the, uh, the day routine. I think he was the best example of that particular verse, who I think so. I just thought about that too. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you so much. So yes, Bhaktivinoda Thakur in our parampara, he's the father of Bhakti Siddhanta Maharaj, who is the guru of Srila Prabhupada. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur is just, uh, you know, amazing. He is he's, he's, uh, an acharya who has contributed immensely uh, in many, many areas. Combination of all what the previous acharyas have done. He has written such wonderful songs and he has written such deep scriptures. Both he has written uh, so nicely and he has demonstrated and he conducted. So yes, Bhaktivinoda Thakur, and he's a, he was a Grihastha throughout. He did never gave up the Grihastha ashram. He continued to be a Grihastha till the end, but he was a perfectly pure devotee, a associate of the Supreme Lord, 
directly from the spiritual world who came to demonstrate how to live a grihastha life and yet be a perfect devotee. So yes, thank you for sharing. Yes. Um, in one of the verse you explained about Mahatmas hmm. and another one we have explained about devotees. Is there any difference between Mahatmas and devotees uh -huh. in terms of their work or their duties? Yeah. So Mahatmas, what was described in the second verse. So Mahatmas were described in the second verse and there is no relation or there is no where is the second verse right here samachitta prashanta vimanyavaha suhrida and sadhu there is nothing here which talks about connecting with god it is about all about controlling the mind and controlling the senses and how one relates to the material world relates to the material world in a very very equipoised manner and in a very detached manner that is the sort of the uh, principle of jnana yoga those who follow the process of jnana or karma or even to some extent dhyana yogis whereas in the next verse all those things are included but the part that is important that defines this verse is mai ishe krita sauhrida artha. That one who is doing his activities, krita, for the purpose of artha to develop a loving relationship, sauhrida, with God, Isha. So one who is doing that for that purpose, it is the consciousness that is different. Externally, it is still the same. That person also is not interested. Na priti yukta. He is still not interested in such people who are deham bhara uh, varti keshu or constantly chatter, chattering about you know uh, me and mine, uh, griheshu about my house, my wife, my child, my property, my this, my that. They are also detached. But the main purpose is to create attachment or a loving relationship with God. That aspect is missing in the impersonalists because they do not have any conception of a personal form of Lord. So it is very hard to develop a relationship with abstract thing. How can you develop a relationship with, uh, let's say, you know, energy? Can you develop a relationship with light? But you can develop a relationship with, let us say, that Prabhuji there. You say that, oh, you are very nice, Prabhu, and you know, come, let us meet in the park. We will have prasadam together. You can develop a relationship with a person, but it's not possible to develop a relationship with some abstract um, entity. So that is the impersonalist versus a personalist who is developing a loving relationship with Bhagavan, with Isha. So that is the distinction. Thank you. Yes, Mataji. Prabhuji, uh, uh, here the verse was saying that uh, we should we should avoid talking on the household related things. But if somebody is approaching us with, like, you know, when somebody goes on talking that way, how is the best way to what is what is the what is the best thing to do? Uh, avoid how to avoid? Like, is do you have any suggestion? So, okay, so your question, I just want to rephrase the question or uh, put the question uh, that you are making progress or trying to make, we are all aspiring or we are all practicing to make progress in bhakti, Krishna bhakti, and so are you. But you cannot avoid talking to others, so to say, you know, you have your whatever friends or, you know, circle of people you associate with and <clears throat> you are talking to someone and they go on talking about all these things, materialistic things. Deham Bharavarti Keshu. They are doing Deham Bharavartala. All things. So how do you deal with such a situation? Correct? Yes, sir. That's the question. Okay, very nice question. So it takes 
first of all there is not i would say you should not just definitely you should not try to become their guru at that moment i'm not saying anybody would do that but i'm just starting with all the points oh you should don't start a bhagavad gita class there okay um that will you know upset people and they will and especially not with the mentality of holier than thou that oh you know i know more and one should you should we should all one should not do that the best thing is to demonstrate by example and when it comes your turn to speak so you are in a group of people when it comes your turn to speak whatever they and this requires some intelligence also perhaps whatever they are saying find a you know find a crack so to say and say something which is spiritual or at least in the direction of being spiritual or in the direction of being detached or something that that is not adding fuel to the fire so to say they are talking about all the you know uh how many uh, what is their uh, you know uh the size of their property and the brand name of their cars and all the other things and then you start also sort of do, don't add to that at least stay neutral or add something which is spiritual over time so that's one thing i can suggest other devotees are also welcome to share by the way another thing is to over time this may not be the first meeting or the only meeting people will begin to realize that yes you are you know a you know going down the devotional path and people will over time realize and and respect that i will tell you most people they realize that yes this is a better path somehow i am unable to follow it because of whatever reason but they at least respect internally externally they may not respect or they may even demean but internally they know yes you know there is some respect and they will then begin to respect that about you and they will stop talking like all these nonsense things in your presence it may also so happen that you are also excluded from that circle very soon because by inviting you they are restricting their nonsense talks but this this person is there we cannot you know have a glass of wine we cannot have you know talk about all the other things so you know isko chodo so um, like that may also happen so somehow or the other but don't give up your behavior your example setting and in a intelligent way in a uh, what should i say conscious way uh, or a conscious in the sense like you know to not uh, uh in in a in a in a nice way polite way say something which will forward their consciousness or you know and definitely leave the door open for them in the future they can connect with krishna sometimes people say something which makes them completely uh, distasteful somebody said like uh, no no i will not come to your house because you cook meat i will not eat at your house okay you may not eat at their house fine but you don't have to say it in their face and you know uh, I, i don't want to say but maybe you can even eat if it has been cooked at least you know in a clean vessel or something it's you know it consider it as a service that i am going to their place to set a or sh- example to demonstrate or whatever it's okay like you know the sadhus go to all kinds of places what is the purpose of sadhu to come to this materialistic house they have much better places to live so they come to these down trodden places so that they can help others with the same consciousness with the same mood we can uh for the purpose of helping or not helping in that sense like again not a superior and lower mentality but you know to connect with them again this also connects with the conscious the topic of 
giving association versus taking their association. You give as much as possible, not like a guru, not like holier than thou, but at, as, as an example, in a nice, polite way, give your association, don't become like them, don't take their association in that sense, be a friendly person, all those things. So I think a lot more can be said about this, but that... Thank you very much. Other devotees want to add to, to what was uh, to the question or to the answer? I mean, anybody else wants to add points? There are a lot of points, very thoughtful, very important question. Anyone? Okay, my personal experience has been what they said, right? Not adding fuel and fire. So that has kind of worked in my experience. Yeah. And for a period of time, they were, you know, what they said, right? <laughs> yeah, and be ready for being excluded also. And that is fine. You have this whole inclusion here. So, <laughs> what, what, you know, it's it's good, you know. Uh, on Saturday evenings, we don't get uh, earlier. We used to get invitations many years before, uh, ago. These days, uh, we are so thankful nobody invites us. Then we can associate with all of you. Now we cannot do all those things, even if we want to, because we have this other nice association. Anyone else on the Zoom? Oh, I see... Uh, Narutam Vilas Prabhu or Mataji, you have the hand raised. Was that? Thank you. Hey, hey, Shabu. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, please. Well, I just remembered a, a um, an anecdote, so to say, um, by one of Prabhupada's servants. Um, there was a, a race car driver. His name is Graham. Um, Mr. Graham. Um, he was a race car champion driver. So, Prabhupada, he, so the devotee mentions that Prabhupada talk in length about cars with him. And the Buddha's like, what is going on? Why is Prabhupada talking? And Prabhupada, I mean, he was surprised in both ways, saying that Prabhupada knew a lot about cars. And why is Prabhupada talking about cars? <laughs> so why not this? Oh, we know the body, we are this, we are that. So Prabhupada is having such a wonderful conversation talking about cars, so to say, in this connection that anything apart from Krishna. But Prabhupada said that was the devotional service because Prabhupada used that as an entry point and make him, you know, maybe lower his guard, guard down. And then I had a very nice conversation. I just read the conversation, it's a very nice conversation where they're, not, they're wonderful exchange. So Popa use, even though it is mundane, so to say, use that as a as an entry point to uh, to uh, make sure that, oh, okay, this person doesn't just preach, 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 preach. Okay, he can talk and you know, lower his guard down and then there's a free flow of conversation too. So I just remembered about that past time. Very nice. Yeah, that the important thing I realized in what you said is the lowering the guard. So, you know, mingle with them, come to their level. And then, you know, they will open their, you know, it helps to make them comfortable to, to talk about things. And of course, Srila Prabhupada's reputation or his sort of position precedes or, you know, him. So, yes, very nice point. Anything else? Okay. Yes, uh, Bhagirath Prabhu. Uh, it's like Bhagavad Gita austerities speech on a greater calendar. So it's not going to be an easy thing, but Yes, very nice point Bhagirath Prabhu is bringing up austerity of speech. So, you know, for the purpose of leaving a good impression on them and a future possibility of them getting interested in Krishna Katha. It is an austerity. One could consider it an austerity. I think that's what you meant. That it one can consider it as an austerity of speech to, to you know, to speak in their language. Like Srila Prabhupada, I'm sure he was feeling austerity when he was talking about cars. For him, austerity is not to talk about Krishna. That is his uh, enjoyment. Austerity for him is to talk about cars. But in that example, he underwent that austerity for the purpose of uh, leaving a very good impression on the person that, you know, we are not some aliens. Devotees are not from a different uh, planet who you cannot talk to. They're not a cult. 
it's not a cult it's not a you know uh, some brainwash shri prabhat by the way it is brainwash our brain is so dirty it needs to be washed <laughs> anyway it's not any kind of cult or brainwashing it's a simple um god consciousness okay so we will end here anything else last last and final call okay thank you so much shri jain yes do you have a question i jain i am delighted to join this class today thank you thank you yeah. so much. and friday and saturday both the days i will be busy from today onwards <laughs> okay yes <laughs> good good and, good, uh, my, good my 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 daughter also wants to join this class two classes i will ask mata ji to can include my daughter's name sure thank you thank you suri narayan pro yeah. sure sure all are welcome thank you hare krishna shrila prabhupad ki jai granthraj shrimad bhagavatam ki jai jai Hare Krishna thank you Prabhu ji Hare Krishna Prabhu ji thank you thank you Prabhu ji Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Prabhu ji